Tim, you've written this book, Does God Always Get What God Wants? Why did you write this book? Well, uh, early in 2011, my wife died of breast cancer. And she had been battling with the disease for six years. And so we've had a, a journey together, not only with all the different stages of the disease as the cancer metastasized and progressed, but also a, a faith journey together. And part of that journey for someone like me entails going to a, a Christian bookstore, for example, and seeing what books are available on the topic of suffering. And what I found was not particularly satisfying or helpful. And so I had to do some lateral thinking and, and think about the nature of God, the nature of the world that God has made, and also um, the interaction between the two of them. And uh, as I read and thought and shared it with, with others, including my minister, I came to some conclu conclusions which I feel needed to be shared with others. Since then, um, I found a few other books that have been resonate more with the kind of topic and the way I look at it. And so it's great to feel that it's not the only book on this matter that addresses it in the way that I do. What are you trying to emphasize about God in this book? Well, I think too often when we think of suffering, we, we have a certain preconceived idea of what God is like. And it's a God that has all those omni characteristics, omnis omnipotent, or powerful, omniscient, or knowing, omnipresent. Uh, some even go further and, and also have other classical attributes that God is impassive or doesn't respond to any negative emotions. And of course, God never changes. He's immutable. And so this classic picture of, of God can actually make God feel more distant and someone who doesn't really engage with us when we're suffering. As I began to think more about God and God's relationship with the world, it seemed to me that we needed to really re-emphasize the Trinitarian nature, nature of God, a relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and emphasize the relational character of, of the nature of God rather than the character of power and of knowledge. And that allows us to realize that God is with us as we suffer. And God is not distant and far away, but actually one who's engaged in the world and has suffered in, in God's self, in, in, the, in the Trinity. And that makes a huge difference as to how we approach suffering. Why is a suffering God important to you and to this book? I think it's important because it allows us to relate with God better as a God who suffers with us rather than a God who is impervious to any sufferings that we have that we personally experience or the sufferings of others on this planet and the suffering of creation that's groaning under the strains uh, of its nature. Um, I think the Trinity emphasizes that more because not only did Jesus die on the cross, but God the Father and the Spirit were integrally involved in that action. They had different experiences of it in a sense, but it was a, an experience that they all shared in different ways. For example, without trying to um, split the Trinity into three different people, how a parent sees their child suffering uh, is very different from how the child themselves sees them suffering. But the parent still suffers. The grieving father who is looking at the dying child on the cross is very important. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who is the life giver uh, that we read of in, in Genesis, um, is suddenly seeing the Son breathe his last. And so there's this experience of the anti-creation, in a sense, when Jesus dies. Um, and so without that sense that God suffers with us, it's kind of hard to relate to God. And often we can get angry at God, but we're getting angry at a God because we don't think he cares or is involved or knows what it's like to suffer. Why did you choose the title, Does God Always Get What God Wants? A great question. Many of the people who I interacted with while my wife was, was sick 
and even uh, at her funeral came giving me comfort and hope using the well-worn phrase, God is in control. Now, that was meant as a statement of comfort and of hope, and I wasn't offended by it. Um, but it's not something that I think is particularly helpful in that context. Um, so it made you, makes you think when we say God is in control, we're appealing back to that omnipotent kind of God, a God who's not only in control of everything, but has even predetermined everything. And so that leaves us with a kind of a closed world, a closed cosmos, where even our free will is, is questionable as whether it's truly free. And so uh, I don't find that explanation particularly helpful. If you believe in predestination in a strong sense, then the answer to the question, does God always get what God wants, must be yes. On the other hand, if you reply to it no, that doesn't necessarily mean that chaos rules supreme and everything then is up for grabs. And so we have to explore different possibilities. Those possibilities not only deal with the nature of free will and different ways in which we can understand God and suffering when we're truly uh, free to respond to God's love and to respond in faith, but also to uh, look at the way the world has been made by our Creator God and the freedom that God has given the world to grow and develop, a freedom that's balanced on one hand by the so-called laws of nature, and on the other hand by a degree of randomness and chaos, which brings the two together and allows new change and development to take place. It's just that that process isn't always neat and tidy and can end up with the natural evils, including cancer uh, and other things that we don't like. So um, it's a question that is provocative, yes, but it makes us think about what are the, not only the character of God uh, that we worship, but also the way that God works in the world. So in addition to the God is in control way of looking at suffering, what are some other frameworks for looking at suffering in the world that your book presents? Well, I present five altogether. And all of them, one can find verses in the Bible to support it, which doesn't help you very much. But nevertheless, it illustrates that there's a diverse range of positions that can be said to be Christian. One of them is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, and so uh, the idea that suffering is important for character development. There are others, such as even God can't do everything which really sees God as somewhat limited in how God can work in the world, which restricts his power in many sense. But the reason why certain people hold that view is because they're trying to emphasize his love, and the love can't be coercive. Another one is a response of protest, that suffering and evil is just outrageous and wrong, and all one can do is, is be full of rage towards it. That rage can end up leading to atheism, of course, um, but it's also something that you see in the, in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, in the context of lament, where various prophets and psalmists rage against God, but they also end up with a statement of hope that God will not fail them, that he will keep his promises and, and be with them. And so these illustrate a, a spectrum of positions that uh, try to address the, the problem of suffering uh, and the suffering that humans make. I have to say, though, I have not found any one of them to be particularly convincing. There's good features about several of them, and those features are important. And I think there are those who, when they're suffering, um, may want to throw in the towel and reject their Christian faith. And what I would suggest is that rather than doing that, maybe it's the, your particular un framework of understanding God's character and God's involvement in a suffering world. That's the weakness. And you're trying to put too much uh, weight on that framework and the scaffolding is collapsing in the midst of your suffering. 
But there are other alternative Christian ones that may be more better for you, ones that um, address those questions in a way that appeal to you and still maintain your faith in a loving Trinitarian God. Tim, what do you hope readers will take from this book? In times of suffering, people often wonder where God is. I understand that. I think we need to look at the whole of the biblical narrative and realize God's presence with his people. Not throughout the whole of the Old Testament, for sure, um, but also, most vividly, the Trinity's presence in the cross. A God who has suffered death and has shown through the resurrection that there is hope and new life and that suffering is not the last word. So God is with us. Suffering is not the last word. And the resurrection gives us confidence to face suffering squarely and to move forwards. And as Christians, we're invited to partner with God to alleviate the suffering that we see around us in the world in whatever means that we can and that are appropriate to us. Uh, and that's an invitation that the Holy Spirit gives us and enables us to partner with our Trinitarian God uh, in dealing with the problem of suffering and evil in this world. And we work toward that and work towards the time when everything will be put right. There's a great hope within the Old Testament of God who's going to finally put everything to right, including the distortions in the world that we live in. And that is something that we can't achieve on our own. Um, God has to do a new work of creation and bringing you know, heaven and earth together, literally, with God living among us, as it says in Revelation. And that's a powerful image. And in that, we work towards that goal with God's help, but recognizing that without a radical uh, recreation by God, everything isn't going to be put right. We do need God. But the resurrection is the pivotal point in history that shows us what God can do and God what God will do uh, as time progresses. Because I believe the free will that God has given us is genuine, then God needs our help to partner with him to address the evils that we find in the world. Not just the evils that we do, um, the, the wars and the suffering that human beings cause, but to work towards um, the restoration of our planet, the restoration of our physical bodies through medicine and uh, other things. Without our help, God is limited in what he can do. So we're wor working towards that goal. And we've seen hints of that in the resurrection of Jesus, a strong hint of what God can do and will do in bringing new life from death. And so in the end, um, that is our goal, is to see heaven and earth come together, so to speak, with God living among us, uh, and that is a radical recreation of God. And all the things that we do in helping God build the kingdom of God, address the issues of suffering, those things will survive um, in the final analysis. And that's what God calls us to do. Who is the book written for? Well, a lot of the questions that I was grappling with, um, I did in my head and also in conversation with um, our minister. Um, but I realized that the conclusions that I came to needed wider dissemination amongst the church. Um, it's a different way of thinking about God's action in the world that than is commonly preached in, in many sermons. And so it's for church people in mind who are trying to grapple with the issue of God and suffering. Um, it's also for you know the medical profession, people who are perhaps Christians working in that day by day, uh, how you, you create coherence with that without having a somewhat schizophrenic existence. Um, so it, it will help that. It's, it's a, a thought-provoking book. It's a personal book. Um, and it's one that is designed to give hope and encouragement 
for people who suffer. But it's probably not the kind of book that you should read in the middle of a crisis. It's the sort of thing that when you afterwards, when you're trying to make sense of things, maybe this is the kind of book to pick up and to help you put your life back together, having faced some kind of tragedy. What I hope that churches will do with a book like this is to read it and study it, to create book study groups that address the tough questions of life, questions of suffering. And so it would be great just to see uh, book study groups wrestling with the various topics that come in the chapters, um, the Trinity, you know, different explanations that Christians have for suffering. We talk about prayer and miracles and the cross. Um, all these things are often f very familiar to church people, but not integrated very well. And I think people need to have space where they can ask really tough questions about suffering and the Christian faith in a way that provides hope uh, and encouragement.